what makes a good thumbnail that gets clicked. Composition is king, baby. When I'm talking to creators, we'll talk about the title, we'll talk about the thumbnail, and then I'll say, okay, now what's your first five seconds? I made a thumbnail with Max. It's an image of him with a cow, with a police officer, and then you click the video and right away you're confirmed. He's literally walking around the streets of London with a cow, with a beer in his hand. And it is an immediate payoff. And that video I think has like 5 million, 6 million views or something like that. Making sure those first five to 10 seconds have some sort of payoff to the thumbnail. You gotta just press record. David Altizer is on the Think Media channel today. And I'm excited because dude, you've worked for a lot of different YouTube channels. And now you have this next transition to thumbnail design. Yeah. First of all, tell us like, what kind of YouTube channels are you working on? And then are you, yeah. tell us your thumbnail design process. How are these big YouTubers like, you know, <laughs> how do they do it? And you know, break down that process. Sure, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently working pretty much full time with Curtis Connor. Folks. He's a, a comedian commentary channel. And he and I have really developed a great kind of design language based off of what he was already doing, but I've kind of simplified it down and kind of elevated it is what I told him. I was like, I've been a fan of your work for years and you know, you've, he kind of created this like yellow uh, Helvetica font style on top of him, like giving a crazy reaction with a bunch of messy stuff behind it. I call it the scrapbook uh, style uh, because it looks like a scrapbook. It looks like somebody took pictures and cut them out and then pasted them on a picture. And so he kind of he actually humbly said, yeah, I think I created this style, but now almost every commentary channel does that format. So I want to highlight that. Like he has the ability to kind of own that style because he literally pioneered it, but we needed to elevate it. And that simply meant simplifying it, cleaning it up. And thankfully with Curtis, I'm given a really you know high quality uh, video file of him giving me faces. So usually he'll have the title in mind. He'll maybe even have most of the video shot, and then we'll get on the phone and maybe discuss you know the thumbnail. And he because he's so intuitive and he's been a YouTuber for so many years, he kind of just knows what what it should be. And so he'll tell me like, hey, here's what I'm thinking, and then I'll spitball some ideas. Then he'll give me like you know a 10 or 20 second clip of him giving me like three or four different faces. And you know, he has a nice camera and nice lighting. And so I'm able to just pull that out and stick it on. And then almost everything else though is like generated either with AI or from the assets that he's referring to. One of the things that has been really helpful with my career is AI upscaling. So I work with Cody Co as well and uh, Curtis Connor. Those Both those guys do reaction content. And often the things they're reacting to are TikToks or like, really low quality images. And so in the past, their thumbnails would almost look a little uh, kind of low quality because like they're just reacting to this really, you know, blurry object. Maybe they even scale up to it or whatever, like scale into it. But there's some tools like uh, Topaz and another tool that I use called Magnific AI, which is extremely expensive. I don't necessarily want to recommend this to everybody, but if it's something that it's $40 a month, it's extremely pricey, but okay. <laughs> it is, but because I'm doing this full time, I'm making, you know, two to four thumbnails a day and I use it every day. It's become you know, part of my budget and part of my workflow. They also have a free trial. So if you want to try it out, you could try it out. But what it does is it uses some of the same technology that you see in mid journey, but it takes like an image that you import into it and it creates AI on top of like from, from, from a pixel for pixel basis, it re replicates what it's seeing underneath the AI, if that makes sense. So like yeah. when I input it, it's going to output a really sharp, crisp, representation of what I inputted uh, using AI. So like if it's somebody that if, if I have a photo of a person that's not recognizable, it's not a famous person, I can just put it in there and it'll spit out a sharper, cleaner image essentially. Uh, right. So I use that all, all the time now. So that's kind of been my like little secret sauce. Uh, but I work give with us, Max. Give us all the secret sauce. What other, what other AI tools or, <laughs> you know, Give, give us all of it. This yeah. is awesome. I'm loving it. The thing that I love to use for mockups uh, right now is actually ChatGPT4 with Dolly. So Dolly is their like version of Midjourney, which is an AI art uh, creation tool. And it's not as advanced as Midjourney. It's not even as advanced as some of the other tools that are out there. But what is so great about the ChatGPT AI art uh, creation is that you can talk to it like a human. And so I will actually 
just start talking to it and I'll just say, hello, my name is David Altizer. I am a YouTuber who makes content about cameras and I'm doing a review on a new Sony camera that's brand new. It does this, this, and this. Like I give it all the, the context of like what that video is. And then you say, I want a thumbnail where I'm off center and the camera is focused with leading lines leading into the camera so that the viewer can see that camera and uh, like their eyes go to that. But I still want to be in the image, you know, give me a mock-up. And then it just will spit out a mock-up. I'm like, okay, cool. Now can we do it a little darker and blah, blah, blah. And so then I'll maybe have four or five mock-ups of a thumbnail and I could even input like a photo of my face and be like, okay, here's, here's my face. Make sure that the subject kind of looks like me. And so then it'll kind of create, you know, a subject that sort of looks like that. And if you're watching the Think Media video right now, you can see some of the examples that I've done. This one specifically is with Hayden Hillier Smith. He was doing a video where he was talking about a film that he made and he wanted to have kind of like the before and after, he wanted to have leading lines going into the center of the frame. And we had a bunch of mock-ups and we landed on this one as our format. And I was able to take that mock-up and basically just plug in the actual assets into that. And I didn't really even use any of the AI stuff, but it was such a wonderful way to collaborate with AI to spit out something that we wouldn't have even thought of and just have kind of that collaboration. You might hear all the time with Mr. Beast and Ryan Trahan and many others talking about how you need to have uh, YouTuber friends, you need to have people to work with. And I, I don't think this rep, uh, <laughs> replaces that. But if you are just getting started, using this is a great way to collaborate with something. It is just a robot, but <laughs> but it's yeah. so uh, amazing how, how, how great this is. And, and just seeing something, at least for me, I'm such a visual learner. When I see something, I'm like, oh, that makes me think of this. Can you add this to it? And then it just does it. And I might have, yeah, again, like five or six mock-ups that I can then show the client. We then dial it down to like one or two. And then I just use that as a way to kind of get started so that we kind of know where we're going with it. I think that's a hard part for a lot of people is they don't know where to start. So the fact, I mean, you're giving away the secrets here, which is amazing. And I actually, I've experimented <laughs> a little bit with chat GBT4, but like you're encouraging me to go do that more. So this is, this is really, really yeah. cool. Are there any other prompts that you do because you're really just using this to get ideas right that's the ultimate mm -hmm. goal is you're trying to you're trying to spark inspiration on how to actually you know compose and set up the thumbnail is that right correct yeah and, and every once in a while i will create backgrounds uh using ai mid journey is better but you know what's funny about mid journey is it's so advanced uh, now that it looks very photoreal and it starts to do what you were talking about earlier about how like there's so many little details that you have to remove. So like mid journey looks so photoreal that like I'll receive a background that, that looks like a real photo, but like there's wires in the background. There's like a blue trash can over here and like I need to clean it all up. Whereas ChatGPT is not as advanced. So some would argue that it doesn't look as realistic, but it's more simple and minimalistic because it's not, not as advanced. So like I find ChatGPT's Dolly image creation definitely good enough for thumbnails. If anything, I kind of like how simple it is because it usually spits out uh, an AI image that's pretty simple and minimalistic. And then what I'll do is I'll actually take that Dolly image, which again, isn't as advanced as what Midjourney does, but then I'll input it into Magnific, which is what I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And it then takes that AI generated image and makes it look photo real. So I have this very simple, clean AI image that I then input into Magnific, which then converts it to looking realistic and sharp. And then I pull that into Photoshop and use that as an asset. That's super cool. I love that. Hey, real quick, I wanna shout out today's sponsor, video.ai. Video.ai is a tool where you can upload your long form videos or podcasts and it will automatically chop it up for you to repurpose into shorts and clips with customizable animated captions and brand kits. My favorite way to use this tool is for finding podcast clips that we can upload to our YouTube channel. I simply upload a video and then it breaks down the entire conversation so that I can skim through the topics to find something that would make a great clip. This saves me a ton of time so I don't have to rewatch the entire podcast looking for good clips. From here, all I need to do is edit it how I would like, export it, and then upload it to our YouTube channel. Now, if you want to give it a try, check out the link in the description of this video. I do want to talk about what makes a good thumbnail and 
And, yeah. uh, you know, and even people too, they might hear this and they assume in order to make good thumbnails, they, they need AI tools and they need Photoshop and you really don't no, you like don't. Well, yeah, a, great, don't. a great example is I saw on your just like personal channel, it has like half a million views and it's the 4k yeah. forget SSDs, iPhone 15 pro records, SD cards. And the thumbnail is yeah. so simple mm -hmm. and there's just a little bit of text and mm -hmm. Did you, you click know, the video? Watch the intro. Did you see the intro? Yeah. So that's what I was going to mention too, is that's a great example. And I'm, I'm curious if you, if you did this on purpose and if you see other, cause I noticed Ryan will do this sometimes and other YouTubers, mm -hmm. but when you click on that video, there's a direct payoff because it's actually, yep. it looks like a screenshot of the opening frame. Yeah. So tell me, is that a strategy that you use and, and, uh, 100%. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'd say the, the greatest success in that conversation with my work uh is with max i think the title is i broke laws in front of the police it's an image of him with a cow with a police officer and then you click the video and right away you're you're confirmed he's literally walking around the streets of london with a cow with a beer in his hand and it is an immediate payoff and that video i think has like five million six million views or something like that i also tried it with curtis curtis is a different he has a very dedicated very strong following loyal fan base so he could sort of like rant for two minutes at the beginning and people will still watch it he'll still get two million views even if he took three minutes to get to the point but i <laughs> i have been encouraging him to uh, have intros that match the thumbnail or, or maybe like a teaser at the beginning and he's been seeing success with that as well So yes, this is 100% a strategy and one of the things I forgot to bring up when I'm talking to creators is We'll talk about the title. We'll talk about the thumbnail and then I'll say okay now. What's your first five seconds and like literally that is Part of the discussion when we're talking about thumbnails is like making sure those first five to ten seconds have some sort of payoff to the thumbnail because we do live in a, unfortunately, in a day and age on YouTube where people will maybe put something that would be considered clickbait on the thumbnail and you click it and it's completely different. You know, it's just, it's not what the thumbnail is. They were just trying to get you to click on it. And so I think simply telling the truth uh, goes a long way with all things, you know, <laughs> in life. Uh, but in particular with videos, if you are really, you can kind of enhance the thumbnail make it cleaner make it pop make it look better to like get get somebody's attention but it still needs to have a baseline truth telling aspect to it that you are paying off as quickly as possible especially if you're a a, a new creator i think a lot of bigger creators that you may watch you could maybe have an argument with me on it's like well they don't do it it's like well yeah they have six million subscribers <laughs> and they're averaging one million views per video if you remember, if any of you were Casey Neistat fans during the vlog era, did you care what title or thumbnail was on that video? No, you just clicked it and watched it because you became a fan of Casey Neistat's daily vlogs and anytime he would post, you would watch it. The thumbnail and title was almost irrelevant, you know, for the most part. So I think that those are two different models and Curtis definitely has that a little bit too. But anyways, the intro and the thumbnail need to kind of match in my opinion. I think that's kind of a secret uh, a secret trick that you can do. And I've done it with my own videos. Like you said, that was just a video. It took me two hours to make it, but I had that intention of like shooting the thumbnail and I actually edit the thumbnail before I edit my video. So when I'm doing my own videos, I'll actually get my thumbnail finished before I even start my thumb, my, my actual video edit. And then that kind of can almost dictate the video in a way, at least the intro. Yeah, that's really good. What are other tips you have on what makes a good thumbnail that gets clicked composition is king baby so composition is is king for all things when it comes to cinematography when it comes to photography when it comes to fine art and the same is true with thumbnails any form of art composition is king you may have heard that in other uh niches can like you explain what composition is yes the the easiest way to look at it and again i would recommend everybody go outside of the youtube box or the youtube bubble that we live in and and study art study fine art study why certain paintings are actually good study why certain films and filmmakers are great at storytelling and I think that's such a great way to have a rich kind of understanding and baseline of like what actually looks good. And that's how you develop your taste. And that's how you, you were asking earlier, like you don't want to just copy other YouTubers. If you have all these input sources from other uh, genres of filmmaking, photography, and fine art, those things are going to come into play when you make your thumbnails. 
so that your thumbnails actually look completely unique technically, but you're actually pulling from all these other sources. Anyways, the way that I get started and you can download my asset for free plug plug on learnthumbnails.com, And, uh, it's a free, uh, asset. I have a rule of thirds that is a uh, 16 by nine. It basically looks like a tic-tac-toe grid. The image just is more interesting and more appealing and has better balance when you line your subjects up within those either cross points or uh, little points within those boxes. And so you almost want to treat each box in that tic-tac-toe grid as its own image in of itself. And having an understanding of, of image balance is really important too. So for example, if I had a bunch of the weight of the image, I'm saying that in air quotes, but if I had like the subject on the right hand side of the image and I had like a car on the right, but then there was just a big sky on the left and it was just empty, the image would feel lopsided. It would feel like all the weight of the image is on the right. And so you can, you want to balance that out almost as if all the objects in your frame are on a scale. You balance that out by maybe putting a big piece of text on the left that they can then be a size that sort of matches what's on the right hand side and that starts to balance the frame or you move your subject into the middle you move all the objects on the right and then you have text on the top left or something like that the asset pack that i'm giving away for free too also includes the time code uh in the right scaling and the rounded edges that youtube has as well so if you haven't noticed right now youtube rounds all the corners of your thumbnail on the home screen and on the subscribe feed and it's different on mobile and it's different on desktop. The roundedness is actually more round on a mobile device and it's less round on a desktop. The time code is also larger on a phone and the time code is smaller on desktop. And what I mean by that is on the bottom right hand side of the thumbnail, you'll see the length of the video. Uh, that is always taken into account when I'm making my thumbnails. You never want to have text or anything important on that bottom right side. So you can basically put text or things top left, top right, bottom left, but never touch the bottom right. And I almost treat that time code as part of my composition. So if that big chunky 10 minute and 16 second time code is on the bottom right, I kind of want to balance that somehow by putting something on the left hand side of that rule of thirds to then balance that time code. Because again, people are, are not viewing the thumbnail as just an image, especially on a you know 27 inch monitor, which is what I have at my desk here. They're viewing it mostly on a phone and certainly now on TVs as well, which has been really exciting as well. Because of the TV model, if you're a creator or if you're a creator who has a lot of TV viewership, you could have a little bit more detail going on in the image. And I've seen that work really well. Mark Rober, for example, has had some successful thumbnails. I mean, he's very successful in general, but he's had some that were very highly detailed, but still very simple in idea. So I think that's where the confusion can be. You, you can have detail, like if it's a big explosion with like fire and stuff, but it's still just an explosion. There's not wires, there's not different colors mixing and matching, but there is details within that. So if you're a TV viewer, you can do that. And we're able to get away with that with the editing podcast, for example, which has a large TV viewership audience. So anyways, composition, we could go on a tangent with that for a long time. I personally really like having the subject on the left-hand side of the image because of that time code. But I also do a lot where the subject is just dead center with leading lines going into the middle. But again, do some research outside of YouTube and study composition. Some of the best painters and some of the best artists in the world have some of the best compositions that you can learn from. And I would highly encourage you to go outside of YouTube to learn that, to be honest. It's funny because I've heard people say the opposite of they enjoy putting or prefer putting the the face on the right hand side, like you've seen the Mr. Beast reacts videos, because the time code just kind of covers like maybe like the neck They're or the sure shirt or, or something. something. Yeah, no, that works too. Yeah, that totally works. I've done that with Curtis, just depends, but. Yeah, there's never one answer that fits right for every yeah. single thumbnail, right? Depending on your audience, you know, we read left to right. So in America and in the English speaking and in most countries read left to right. It just depends on like what you want them to see first. Mm -hmm. So in the beast reacts, you can sort of on your peripheral see that it's beast. So you know exactly what it is. It's the same face every time too. So like there's nothing there. But for Curtis, like his audience is so dedicated to Curtis that like I kind of want people to just see Curtis's face first because as soon as they see it, they'll probably just click on it. But but if he's reacting to something wacky and crazy, 
that is like going to get a, cl a click, then maybe I'll put that off to the left, you know? So that's how I'm thinking about it is like, what do you want them to see first? Because we read left to right, they may actually see that left hand rule of third first. So if it's the game that you want the focus to be on, then put that on the left. If it's the creator, then put them on the left. You know, with Cody Ko, he's always on the left for the most part. What, what do you think about text on a thumbnail? When should people use text or arrows or certain circles, elements like that? And when should they not use text on, on a thumbnail? So I think you and I would would be in agreement on keeping things as simple and uh, minimal as possible. So uh, Jerry Seinfeld has this famous quote where he says that when he's writing a joke, he takes one word out at a time until the joke doesn't make any sense anymore. And then he puts that last word back in. So I think that should be the same philosophy when you're creating a thumbnail and especially with text. How many words can you remove before it doesn't make sense anymore? So like even if you can just have one word, mm. that would be great. You know, why is a good one with a question mark or how or, uh, you know, those are, are good because they can they can play off of whatever title you have to create some sort of open loop that makes people want to click. So I would just keep it simple, you know, find a font that you really like that is clean and bold, but maybe even something that, that not many creators are using so that you can start to kind of own that font in a way. You know, Trahan has kind of owned that like very simple Helvetica font style and many others are, are using it. I would I would have just encouraged other creators to, yeah, you can be inspired by Trahan, but maybe find a different font that looks a little different. That way you can start to kind of use that as part of your branding. But I would keep it to like a minimum of, you know, or a maximum of like three to four words if you can. Again, Curtis has done more words because sometimes they'll have like a whole sentence there. I don't know if how effective that is to be completely honest. It's just what he does. I usually do the whole edit for Curtis and then he'll actually do the text himself because we found we were going back and forth a lot where he'd be like, put this, no, put this, uh, move it over to the left. I was like, how about this? I'll just give you the clean image. You do the, <laughs> you do the text. So that's our working relationship. So you can get away with more. It just depends on the context, but I'd say good rule of thumb is keep it like under four words. And as far as arrows and circles, I don't use those as much as I used to. I think that might be, it, again, it depends on the niche. I think for you with your basketball stuff, like the arrows and circles make a lot of sense because you could almost not even have any text. It's just pointing to something or circling something. So yeah. it just depends on the niche really, but I don't use a lot of arrows and circles. One thing too, I think most people get wrong in the beginning is they just put the title for text in their thumbnail. And what you yes. need to realize is I like to think of my title and my thumbnail as like a union or like a combo punch, a combo mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. And so usually most people look at the thumbnail first. It catches their eye and then they read the title, which gives more context to what they're looking at. And so that's how mm -hmm. I kind of like to approach things. And I'm curious your thoughts too, because we'll see, yeah. you know, people in our community a lot of times are just putting the same exact title in text and if you actually add something that is completely different and can spark curiosity make them look at the image and then when they read the title now they have maybe the context of what they're clicking but how do you yeah is there any you know tips like that on how you approach just that combination yeah i would actually add to that and say that the first five to ten seconds is also part of that same union because if you if you're successful in having a good title and thumbnail and they're like looking at it on their phone for a second, it's gonna start auto playing as well. And so you've even noticed if you look at even the most recent Mr. Beast videos, he's removed all of the uh, kind of big, bold uh, text at the beginning where it's like captioning because the auto captioning kicks in on the autoplay. And if you have a bunch of text going on on the video, with the closed captioning as well, it kind of is disorienting. So I've even noticed he'll actually turn off the captioning when he does go to the bold text on the frame and then it'll kick back in when he stops using that. So you can actually finagle that and kind of tweak it if you do have text on like embedded in the video itself. That being said, that's, you know, that's beast in that style, but I would keep all three of those things in mind uh, as part of your strategy. But um, absolutely, you don't want to repeat the uh, the title in the thumbnail. Just 
Like if if this is the first time you're hearing that from this point forward, don't ever do that. Like just just don't. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and just like use your imagination on like what I can add to this. Whether it's a question that you can ask that can play off of that title, whether it's um you know how many days you tried it or like I don't know. It's just when you're coming up with your titles and thumbnails, think about both of them together. And when I'm writing out my ideas in Apple Notes, I'll like I'll type the title out. And then in parentheses, I'll put whatever two or three word text that I'm going to put there in like a parentheses so, uh, on the thumbnail. So it's like you really want to think of both. And it's, to be honest, I think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of boldness to not put text. And I would encourage you to maybe even consider trying that because one of the things that can really make you stand out is by simply doing what everybody else isn't doing. And I've seen success on a couple of thumbnails that I've done where it was very focused, very simple. The one I'm thinking of right now is uh, I did a thumbnail for Frame Voyager where it was uh, Killian Murphy and he was just in the middle. Uh, I had like some Inception stuff going on behind him and I had some cool uh, like atomic bomb stuff from Oppenheimer behind him. But it was really focused, really simple. And you could have put text there asking a question, but it really would have thrown off the kind of artistic integrity of it. And because his channel is a video essay channel, it works really well for that. So I would encourage you to almost like don't use text if you don't have to. So good. This was a masterclass on YouTube thumbnails. You gave us <laughs> all the secrets. Thanks for coming on, David. Where can people find you and learn more about thumbnails and hang out with you? Yeah, well, I started a, a new channel called Learn Thumbnails where I'm going to be going over all of these things and more, uh, some of the work that I've done and, and I'm, I'm starting that up. Uh, I feel encouraged by uh, the support of Nolan and many others. So I'm building a whole business around thumbnails and it's all based around learnthumbnails.com. So be on the lookout for that. I'm most active on Twitter and many other uh, thumbnail artists are active on Twitter. So if you want to learn from other thumbnail artists, join us every Thursday. We have a thing called Thumbnail Thursday on Twitter Spaces and you can jump in and uh, be a part of that conversation. We've got some amazing thumbnail artists who work for Eric, Trahan, many others who are on the speaker panel and we'll, we'll talk each week about thumbnails, about the work that we're doing and then we open it up to roasting at the end where you, we roast your thumbnails and give tips and tricks. So follow me on Twitter at DVD Altizer.